Thanks, guys. I'd be happy enough for everyone to just chat all morning, but <laughs> you see, that's awesome. Well, good morning, everyone. Great to see you. We're so glad that you're here on this Palm Sunday. I'm excited to teach this morning from Mark chapter 11. This is actually new terrain for me. This past week, I, I was a little bit jet lagged and I couldn't sleep. And most normal people lie in bed and count sheep, but I'm a pastor, so I'm not normal. I was lying in bed counting sermons. I was thinking, I wonder how many times I've preached. So I started counting and I stopped at 1,500 and realized I am really badly jet lagged. But anyway, one of the things I discovered this week, whenever I got out my Bible and my notes and started getting ready to teach on Mark chapter 11, is that never once in 25 years of preaching have I actually ever preached on the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. So it was back to the study. It was back to having to work hard again. No old message that you can recycle. And, you know, I, like, I was a little bit shocked. For me, I always like to say, oh, yeah, like in 25 years, I've preached from pretty much every book in the Bible. Well, apart from the Song of Solomon for obvious reasons. Okay, just don't go there because nobody needs bare bums and bare other bits on Sunday mornings. And so when people ask me to preach from Song of Solomon, I just say, no, that's for very personal and private devotions. But today we're in Mark 11, and maybe it's a first time for you. It's a first time for me of trying to study this text and listen to what it has to say to us as a group of Jesus followers as we connect our modern lives to the ancient but ever new story of Jesus Christ. What's going on as Jesus enters into Jerusalem the week before his arrest and crucifixion. Interestingly, the triumphal entry of Jesus is documented in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. However, all tell the story from their own perspective. It's not that they're disagreeing. It's a little bit like one's a Baptist and one's a Pentecostal and one's a Catholic and one's a Presbyterian. They've all got a unique perspective on what is unfolding. And today we're studying Mark's text, and we're trying to understand what does Mark want us to know about this very important moment in the Easter week with Jesus. In the village in Northern Ireland where my younger brother Glenn lives with his family, the royal family actually keep a residence there. It's called the Royal Hillsborough Castle. You'll see a picture of it here. It's a gorgeous old building with beautiful surroundings and gardens. And once a year, formerly Her Majesty the Queen, before she went to heaven, would come and visit Northern Ireland. And now King Charles comes once a year and he stays in his Irish home and he gathers all of the local dignitaries and charity leaders and celebrities and he bestows upon them his royal blessing. And when the king comes to Hillsborough, it's a really big deal. The town is closed, the roads are closed, the schools are closed, crowds are filled with uh, crowds fill the streets, flags are waved, the police patrol everywhere, helicopters are whirling overhead, all the newscasters and broadcasters arrive. When the king comes to town, everybody knows about it. This is actually a picture from last year, and this little boy here right in the front, that's my little nephew, Tom. That's right, this is that unforgettable moment in his life when King Charles met a McCready boy. The king will never forget it. <laughs> John Mark in Mark chapter 11 is telling us the story of when a king comes to town. But the story as he tells it is probably a little bit different than you and I might expect from a royal visit. Thank you, Tanya, for reading the story to us this morning. This past weekend was St. Patrick's Day, so last Sunday, and you'll remember it well. I was very excited. It's a great weekend to be Irish. The Irish diaspora from all around the world come out, and we paint the town green. Green is the color of March. The river in Chicago gets dyed green. The beer in Boston and New York gets dyed green. Even McDonald's bring out the shamrock shake. Everybody's excited to be Irish. In my house, we celebrate being Irish by me telling my kids really poor, lame dad jokes, specifically Irish dad jokes. Like, what do you call an Irish man hanging from the roof? Chandelier. <laughs> That's a good one, right? 
I think so. I can just keep those jokes going all day. What do you call an Irish man who sits outside all day? Patio furniture. <laughs> just, I just keep these going. Anyway, St. Patrick's is this moment of celebrating culture. And I want you to keep that image in mind because that's what's unfolding when Jesus enters into Jerusalem. He actually comes during Passover. And Passover is more than just this kind of religious idea. It's actually a cultural celebration of being, Jew being Jewish, being the covenant people. It's a, it's a party in Jerusalem that Jesus entered into. Now, interestingly, we tend to have this idea that God is not fun. And actually, the people who tend to kind of project that idea are usually people that aren't fun. So I totally get how they might get there. But if you think about it, God gave his people these incredible feasts to document and help them remember his faithful work in their lives and what he planned to do into the future. And these feasts, as we think of them, we're so religious, we tend to think of them religiously, but they are deeply cultural and they were more like what we would have today as festivals. Communities gathered together, they slept in tents, they sang late into the night, they drank wine, they saw old cousins that they hadn't seen in a while. The whole of the community was coming back together to celebrate their identity. And it's into this moment where Jesus enters into Jerusalem. The people in the villages surrounding the holy city and the pilgrims that are making their way on the roads towards Jerusalem, they're in a buoyant mood, just like you were today coming to church, right? Well, all the Pentecostals were anyway, coming expectant and filled with faith and hope. That was the Jewish people as they made their way to Jerusalem. I love how N.T. Wright explains it in his commentary, Mark for Everyone, he says this. It was Passover time. And then with an exclamation mark, freedom time. But it was also, as far as they were concerned, kingdom time. The time when Passover dreams, the great hope of freedom of God's sovereign and saving presence being revealed in quite a new way would at last come true. This was an epic moment that Jesus was entering into. And we read about it. We read about it in Mark's gospel. Each of the gospels with Tanya read for us today from Mark's gospel. This strange but incredibly true story about Jesus coming through these villages and then getting on a donkey and riding into Jerusalem. And we have to ask ourselves as readers of the scripture, like, what is that about? Well, the key to understanding this passage, helping us make sense of it, is that we need to set it into its wider kind of messianic context. It wasn't just a random one-off day. It's actually something is unfolding and taking place that we need to pay attention to. And the key to unlocking this story of Jesus on the donkey is actually found in two Old Testament passages, one that's obscure and one that was very well known. The obscure one is from a little prophecy by a man called Zechariah. And the second was from a popular worship song that Tanya actually read for us earlier, Psalm 118. Psalm 118 was like, as we would say in modern vernacular in the church, it was an absolute banger. Everybody knew that song, loved that song. It was like, what a beautiful name it is. Whenever the church sing it, everyone gets really excited. That was Psalm 118. These two texts, Zechariah and Psalm 118, hold the keys to unlock this story. Let me read the Zechariah text for us first of all. The prophet says this, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious. Now, there's a pause there, and I want to hold the pause so that we can really understand the text. The Jewish people are waiting for their deliverer to come, their Messiah, their Savior. Right at this point in history that we're, the Jesus story set in, the boot of Rome is on the neck of the Jewish people. They are under oppression. They are awaiting their king. Now, you imagine if your king's coming to save you, that he's gotta be a certain sort of king. And they read in this text that their king is coming and he is righteous and he is victorious. And so Jewish people who knew this text would have been thinking, yes, that's exactly the sort of savior that we need. And then 
comes the very next verse. Here he comes, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And all of a sudden, you're looking at this prophecy and you're thinking, what on earth? It's almost like bipolar. How can a king who's victorious and righteous come to town riding on a donkey? But don't worry, the very next verse, normal order is restored. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war houses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. Oh, it's okay, it's okay. The king, he might have to hitch a ride on a donkey, but when he comes, he's still coming as a warrior and he's gonna destroy our enemies and he's gonna smash them. But then the very next verse says this, he will proclaim peace to the nations. He will extend his rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The kingdom of Christ, our Christ is the kingdom of peace. And the king who comes in peace. Imagine how confusing that is for a people waiting expectantly, trying to make sense of these years of kind of hoping in the arrival of their Messiah to set them free. You know, without the Zechariah text, the Mark 11 text that we read earlier, Tanya read for us, it kind of just reads a little bit weird. It's like a weird story. It's almost like, Mark's a farmer, and he has a strange obsession with donkeys. Because if you read the Mark story by itself, over half the story is about borrowing the colt, the young donkey. It's the details about the type of animal and the process for borrowing it. In fact, it's so specific that if you read Mark 11 by itself, it just feels like you're reading a first century rental car experience. So you know when you go to pick your car up and you're so excited to get your car, and by the time you get your car, you're just terrified to drive that thing anywhere. All the small print and all the details and all the information. What's happening, guys, is this. This colt, this young donkey, seemingly just a pretty part of the Easter story, is actually the bridge that connects Jesus, his arrival into Jerusalem, with the very messianic hope of Israel. This donkey, it's the missing clue that makes sense of everything else. You see, other kings, other rulers, other leaders, other powerful influencers had entered Jerusalem in the many centuries leading up to this moment. But you know what they came in on the backs of? Military might, nepotism, financial privilege, family ties. But this is the defining piece of evidence that Jesus is Israel's Messiah because the chosen one would come into the holy city, not on the back of power and prestige, but on the back of a foal, like a baby donkey. Mark's just laying it all out, giving it to us straight, not embellishing his words. Some of the other gospel writers, they use like big adjectives, like a large crowd. Mark just says a crowd. He's intentionally trying to fix all of our intention on the man on the donkey. That's what's the big deal. Crowds, we can get carried away in crowds. We've all been there, one way or the other, for good or for bad. But Mark is turning our attention not to the crowd, but to Jesus. In fact, that's the whole point of his gospel. He just wants us all to be captivated by Jesus and right now to be captivated by the man on a donkey. Because believe it or not, the man on the donkey is the one we've been waiting for all along. Uh, Whenever I lived in Canada, uh, it was an interesting kind of upward cultural trajectory for me because I had so much to learn about Canadian culture. Basically, there's a class of people who exist in Canada that transcend humanity. It's almost like they are from among the gods. They are revered and worshipped and considered to be otherworldly. They are the NHL ice hockey players. I mean, these guys, they are monster athletes on the frozen surface, but they move around on skates like they're ballerinas or gymnasts. And they can fight like Roman warriors, but then they can control a hockey puck on ice with the finesse of a new parent holding a little baby in their arms. And they can do all of that. This is what's so amazing. They can do all of that without teeth. (laughs) In our little hometown in Ontario... The most famous hockey player was a man named Joe Thornton. 
And he's, Joe Thornton's like a real ice hockey legend. I'm sure in fo foodie terms here in Australia, you've got guys just like this. This guy played professionally until he was 43. Now, can I just tell you something? That's like my age, and I can hardly get out of bed in the morning. And this guy was playing professional hockey until he was 43. Like, what a beast. And he played for all the best teams, including the Boston Bruins, the Maple Leafs, the San Jose Sharks, the Florida Panthers. In fact, he's on all the top 10 lists for NHL players, just an absolute legend. But here's what I love about Joe Thornton and what I find amazing about him. He comes from a really small town in Ontario, just 40,000 people, and yet out of a community of 40,000 people, grew up an absolute legend. And the thing that I really appreciated about this man was despite the fact that he was ridiculously successful and incredibly rich, like all famous athletes that you know, very influential. He has three citizenships, mega mansions all around the world. Here's the thing I loved about Joe. He would regularly just come back to Canada and in an old pickup truck, drive into town early in the morning and go cheer on the kids at the local ice hockey arena playing hockey. Like, that's amazing to me. Mega mansions all over the world, and yet you have as good a chance of bumping into this guy in the corner shop where he's buying some groceries for his granny. Just love that. He would just come back into town and just take his place in the community. This is actually Mark's point about who Jesus is and why he has Jesus entering Jerusalem riding on a donkey. It's like his old beat-up pickup truck. See, Jesus is a king, and he's been proclaiming this king throughout his whole gospel. In fact, for 10 chapters, Jesus is the sovereign Lord. He's been casting out demons. He's Lord over all things. He's been calming storms. He's even Lord over creation. He's been feeding large crowds miraculously out of a few fish and a couple of bits of bread. He's, he's the Lord over all things. He is the king. This is the point. But now this king comes and he enters Jerusalem and he's not coming with an entourage of wealthy, elite, sanctified people. But Jesus is entering Jerusalem with an entourage of ordinary, everyday pilgrims, people like you and me who are just longing for God to move in their lives, longing to experience the liberation of the promised kingdom, long, longing for the arrival of the promised king. So what Mark is trying to connect us to. He wants us really to understand four things. Who the king is, what sort of king he is, what the king desires from us, and how the king will establish his rule. That's kind of the point of his whole gospel. And he's doing it in this one text, Mark 11, as he backs it up with Zechariah 9, and he also proof texts it and supports it with Psalm 118. Let me just explain briefly about Psalm 118. I think this will be helpful for some of you who are, are kind of like trying to put this all together. Psalm 118 is this song that gets sung every, every time the pilgrims are heading up into Jerusalem. It's one of the Hillel Psalms. There are five of them. Everybody knew these songs, kind of like, my Jesus, my Savior. Or think of a song that you just know, right? Everybody knows it. They're all singing it. There's no words on a screen. They're singing it. And they're using it to evoke in them hope. This might be the time when the one that we're waiting for arrives. And so this is the words they were singing, Psalm 118, 22 to 26. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice and be glad. And then they say something. Now, in, in our English Bibles, it says this, Lord, save us. But in the Hebrew language, Hosanna. That's the connection. And why we say Hosanna on Palm Sunday, this is the connection. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. You know that word, Hosanna, it's kind of known to us in the church. It's part of our liturgy and our songs. We sing songs, like there's a great Hillsong song. I think we sung it earlier, Hosanna. Um, and, and we have some sort of layer of meaning connected with that. Mostly when we sing that song, what our layer of meaning is, oh, I love this song. It makes me feel all nice. But to the Jewish people saying Hosanna 
was to use a term that was just so filled with like meaning and purpose. In a sense, when they proclaim Hosanna, what they're shouting is, God, save us. God, rescue us. It's like a, like a May Day, like a beacon they're calling out. And this day, as a man sitting on a donkey rides in front of them and they take off their cloaks and they throw them down and they take palm branches and they throw them down and they sing this song, what they're saying is, today is the day. The one we've been waiting for is here. The day we've been waiting for, it's today. The king has come. The prince of peace has come to proclaim peace to the nations and to rule from sea to sea. See, if Christmas is the advent of God's savior, we are now witnessing on this first Palm Sunday the advent of God's salvation. Mark is my kind of guy, straight to the point, no beating about the bush, no wishy-washy stuff. He kind of reminds me of my days in youth ministry when you're communicating with young people who don't wanna listen, don't have to listen. They're just very good at telling you when you're boring. Not like adults. You guys just shift around your seat a little bit. That's how I normally know. But these young people, and I remember telling you this story before, but I'll, I'll retell it because I think it, it gets to the point really, really well. But this one time I was working with a group of young people and they were unchurched young people and that was coded language for they were criminals. Like they were just absolute rascals. And we took a whole bunch of them away for a camp. And we had great plans of how God was gonna move. And we had employed all of these resources that had been developed by all these incredibly smart, intellectual people that understand the faith formation of young people. And they reassured us, if you just do this game and this activity and this drama and this little video and beep, 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 and you build this up, eventually you'll be able to talk to these young people about Jesus and they'll get it. Well, after about two or three days at this camp, all of those young people got up picked up chairs, threw them at their leaders and left the room that had enough because their sniff test on the bait and switch was so strong. And I remember going outside to try to mediate this group of young people and this was what they said. Like, that, this isn't me, this isn't, they said, if you wanna tell us about Jesus, just tell us about Jesus. That's what Mark wants to do. And he knows he's only got a few chapters left in his gospel. And so now's the time to dial it in and give us the answers to the question he's been asking all along. Who is the king? Hopefully by now you can answer it. He's Jesus. And what sort of king is he? See, he power hungry, abusive, empire wielding leader. No, he's a servant king, humble, meek, and lowly. He rides on a donkey, comes to proclaim peace. How will this king establish his rule and reign? Through the authority given to him by his father. Authority to lay down his life, Jesus said, and authority to take it up again. And I wanna finish today by trying to answer the last question that Mark seems to be asking in his gospel, and it's this. What does the king, if Jesus is the king, I'm trying to build the case that Jesus is the king. If Jesus is the king, and he's king of your life and king of my life and king of this church, what does the king desire from us? What does he desire from you and from me? Now, I'm just gonna kind of tickle that answer today, but hopefully I'm gonna, I'm, I am gonna answer it. We didn't have time to read the whole story of Mark's experience of the triumphal entry. I want to encourage you this week to read it for yourself. Read Mark 11 and then just keep going to the end of the chapter. Mark's story is so unique to him. So in Mark's story, Jesus gets on a donkey rides down into Jerusalem or up in Jerusalem as, as you go. People have thrown down branches and blankets and proclaimed Hosanna. And then there's this epic moment when Jesus enters into the temple. And according to Mark, do you know what happens in that moment? Nothing. Jesus turns around and walks back out of the temple again. What an anticlimax. It's like, getting invited to church on a Sunday. No, I'm just kidding. Sometimes it's not an anticlimax. Well, what an anticlimax. Jesus goes into the temple and then he just goes again. Now, Mark's story is so powerful because actually what happens is in Mark's story of the triumphal entry, it's not one entry, but it's three. Because he goes into the temple and he goes out again and he goes in again and he goes out again and he goes in again and he goes out again. And it's the next two days that you really need to pay attention to. See, in the next day, Jesus is on his way into the temple and that's where we encounter this absolutely crazy story 
of Jesus cursing a fig tree. It's just such a bizarre story if you think about it. Hopefully you're maybe familiar with it or you can get your Bible open and see it. But what happens in that story is you see for the first time, Jesus using his divine power to do something incredibly negative. And it kind of breaks our box a little bit about the cuffy, the kind of fluffy, cuddly, soft Jesus that we have maybe constructed. Because here we actually see a different side to Jesus. And it's kind of like what's happening there is in an enacted parable. And Jesus walks up to this fig tree. And the text actually tells us what's going on. Jesus walks up to the fig tree because the fig tree looks like it's bearing fruit. But when he gets really close to the fig tree, he becomes aware that it's just a show. It's not bearing fruit at all. And what Mark is trying to do in answering the question, what does, what does the king demand from us? He's giving us in this story what the king demands from those who proclaim him to be king is fruitfulness. Hold on a second, Steve. Are you saying that Jesus is placing demands on my life? I think I am. But I think I've kind of prefaced that by saying I'm talking about King Jesus, not cuddly Jesus. King Jesus walks up to a fig tree and essentially calls out upon close inspection its religious performance. On the outside, it looked like it was bearing fruit but when you get close enough to the action, you realize that it's not bearing fruit at all. I think one of the things that Jesus demands of those of us who call him king is that our lives are seen to be bearing fruit and are bearing fruit. The second story that Mark tells uh, in this context of the triumphal entry is this wild story of Jesus going into the temple on the third day. And we're told that in that moment, he clears the temple. He goes in and he finds money changers. People are doing the business. And in their mind, they're doing important business. You know, I think it's important to realize they're not just necessarily there to make a cheap buck or to take advantage of people. People coming in from the city, pilgrims coming to Jerusalem, they didn't have like a ready supply of lambs to sacrifice. They needed to buy the thing somewhere. Like, like stuff has to happen. But Jesus comes into the temple and as only a king can, he clears the temple. And he throws over the tables and he kicks everybody out. But it's what he says that we're supposed to pay attention to. Jesus in that moment says, through Mark, this is my father's house. And my father's house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. And actually in the rest of the story of that chapter in Mark is a story about prayer. And essentially, I think what Jesus is saying or what Mark is saying about Jesus is that one of the expectations that Jesus puts in our lives is that we're to be found faithful, not just fruitful, but also faithful. And the mark of faithfulness in the life of a Jesus follower, it's actually not about show at all. It's about prayer. And the mark of a faithful community is not about show, it's about prayer. And it's about understanding that while there's always business to be done, nothing is more important than the business of heaven. And the business of heaven is prayer. Now, if you're here today and you're like, I'm not a Christian and I'm just kind of like a church goer, can I just do something? Can I just let you off the hook? You're all good. This is just for those of us who say that Jesus is our king. We're not off the hook. You see, the servant king is calling the people of his dominion to live lives marked by fruitfulness and faithfulness. And here's the thing. I know that sounds harsh, so please forgive me, but that's Mark's point. No sugarcoating. Not anymore. There's not enough time. Just truth. Bottom line for Mark is this. We can't know the salvation of Jesus without knowing the sovereignty of Jesus. Only a king can save. If you want a savior, you have to recognize him as king. I think what Mark would say is this. You might not agree with me on this, and that's totally fine. 
Humble, meek, and mild does not mean weak and soft and tolerant. Jesus is king. And that king has expectations for those of us who call him king. Now, let me finish. I wanted to bring this all the way back into Palm Sunday. So here we are, Palm Sunday. The church gathers on this Sunday every year all across the world. Millions of Christians today are gathering for their Palm Sunday services. They, they put uh, little wooden crosses down or little palm branches. There's just too many of you, and we couldn't afford to buy everyone a little wooden cross. We'll maybe get you to bring your own next year for Palm Sunday. But we, we're entering into a bigger story. Christians all across the world today are celebrating Palm Sunday. And I think that kind of leaves us to ask the question, why? Why, does, why do we actually take this moment to understand this story? Let me just share with you quickly. Palm Sunday serves the church each year by reminding us that our response to Jesus matters. Our response to him matters. Interestingly, before the Babylonian exile, whenever um, the king would enter back into Jerusalem, so that was something that was done every year, was the king would have a, a kind of reenactment of his coronation, and he would enter into Jerusalem every year, and guess what song the priests would sing as they welcomed him into Jerusalem? Psalm 118, that absolute banger. They would proclaim Hosanna, and the king would walk in, and they'd be waving palm branches and laying them before him, and then they would lay hands on him and say, you're our king, right? That, that's what they did. When Jesus enters Jerusalem, there wasn't a priest or a teacher or a Levite to be seen anywhere. What are we supposed to learn from that? I think we're, we're being reminded that Jesus has made us, his people, to be a kingdom of priests unto our God. And so our worship matters. That's what's happening that day on the mount before Jesus makes his way up into Jerusalem. Ordinary pilgrims, people like you and me, are bringing what they have, and they're worshiping Jesus, and they're saying, Lord, save us. And that's what we do every week. That's what church is supposed to be, guys. When we gather every week, we're being restoried into this moment, the proclamation of Jesus as king. Essentially, every song that you sing in church is Hosanna. That's why we do it. The second reason that we celebrate Palm Sunday as a church is that it reminds us that even our smallest offerings of faith and obedience and adoration matter. The image of this crowd casting their garments before Jesus is a practice as old as time. It's like when you lay out the red carpet before the king comes, right? Or before a celebrity in Hollywood. Or I can still, I can still remember my first Sunday here at Riverview. You rolled out the red carpet it lasted for all of one week. It was amazing. Those worshipers that day, I think what touches my heart about that story is that they were not rich, connections of a king. They were just humble, hardworking, poor, working class people. And they took off their cloaks and they laid them down, probably filthy rags, and it was accepted as royal in value and in worth. Guys, what we bring to Jesus in our worship, it's beautiful. It's acceptable because it's to him. And finally, Palm Sunday serves the church each Easter by reminding us that all of us have things in our lives that God might want to use. We don't often think about that, but I want you to think about that this Easter. What's in your life that God might want to use? Do you know what makes me think about this? Is the little family in Beth Fage who were raising a donkey and they're picking up its poop and they're feeding it carrots and to them, they're just raising up a donkey. And what they do not realize is that the sovereign Lord who has designed since before the very foundations of the word, world, his plan of salvation. And a part of that plan is that little donkey. Like that, that's amazing to me. When I think about all the resources that are in our lives, in that story, Jesus sent his disciples to this home and simply said this, the master has need of it. Think of all the things that are in our lives that the master could use. 
Palm Sunday is an opportunity for us to bring those things to him. Some of you may physically own a donkey, I'm not sure. We've all got things in our lives, gifts, talents, resources, time. We've all got things, and Palm Sunday is an amazing opportunity to do that. I'd love to invite the worship band to come out. And there.